I'm guessing that uh, through COVID, you've been spending a lot more time on TV, in particular Netflix and some of those streaming devices. And uh, what I've noticed is that we've had to make decisions. <laughs> like I was watching a show and it, it clicked all the boxes that I wanted to click. It, I didn't have to fast forward through the show. It wasn't excessive in anything it showed. And it was a great story. But for some reason, after about four shows, I really felt this deep conviction that I should shut the show off. And I was struggling because I really liked the show and I couldn't really put my finger on what it was that was wrong with it. And yet I kept, every time I went into my devotions, every time I prayed about it, I, I felt this strong conviction, this sense I shouldn't be watching it. Well, I took it to my men's prayer group and I shared with them the struggle that I was having, but I didn't name the name of the TV show. I just said, there's this TV show I'm struggling with, I told them the story. And the first guy that responded said, you know, I had the same problem. I was watching blank and he named the name of the show that I hadn't even told him. And he went on to say, you know, I, I watched it. It was a great show, but I just felt this darkness in it. And I felt that I really shouldn't be watching it as a follower of Christ. And so I shut it off and stopped watching it. And then another guy piped up, same, named the same show again and said, yeah, it's the same with me. I really like that show, but I just had this sense that I shouldn't be watching it. So I put it down. And you know, when I heard those men speaking, I realized, one, that uh, I needed to stop watching it, that the conviction was from the Spirit of God and I needed to obey it. But that as a follower of Christ, if I'm going to follow Jesus, it means I'm going to have to obey Jesus. That Jesus, when he calls us to follow him, doesn't call us just simply to believe that he died on the cross for our sins and then that's it. Go live the way you want to live, do your life the way you want to do it, and then, hey, when it's over, join me in heaven. That's not the way it works. That when we put our faith in Jesus, we are surrendering ourselves to him and that when we choose to follow Jesus, we're choosing to obey Jesus. And that God calls us to live differently in the world. That once he saves us, once he changes our standing in with regard to sin and he delivers and rescues us from our sin, the ways in which we have disobeyed him, then he calls us to live a completely different life. And that comes out in the way that we handle our money, the way that we save it, the way that we give it, how we value it, the things we do with it. We should be different because we're followers of Jesus. It's the same way with sex, the way we talk about it, the way we use it, how and when and where we use it, what we watch on TV, that should be different for us because we're followers of Jesus. The way we deal with conflict, that it's actually something that God uses in our lives in order to shape us. And he tells us how to deal with it. And believe me, the way God tells us to deal with conflict is very different than the way the world. But if we are going to be followers of Jesus, we should be different. And then that's true of TV too. That if I'm following Jesus, then I need to be obeying Jesus. And the way that the things that I watch and the things that I'm spending my time in should be different than things that the world watches. At least some of it should be different. You know, that's exactly what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be looking in our big picture series at what God means when he gives a covenant with Moses. Join me. You know, it's fun actually being down here uh, where the children are usually taught and the teachers, we have great teachers in our kids program, they usually share with the kids. It's kind of fun to be down here where the action happens. Well, uh, if just for review, the big picture, like if you take the Bible in, a, in five words, these would be my five words, that God created the world and he made everything in it and he made man and woman and he gave them their role and responsibility. But man and woman decide to rebel against God and cast God aside and we're going to live this way ourselves and they brought consequences as a result of that decision. Consequences, remember those F words that I was using, you know, there was flight running from God, there was fight with one another from the family level all the way up to nation level. And then there, there was the flawed area. God gave two major responsibilities, work and reproduction, and they are flawed with pain. And then as a result, there was fatality. Death came to people. And then God became our foe, not our friend. And so God chose at that point, rather than throw us away or, or give us the, dis, the consequences that we deserve, he chose to rescue us. And the rescue plan starts with the next C, covenants. Covenants are promises that God makes 
that he will fulfill that help us understand how God is going to be at work in our world. Now, the first covenant that God used and gave was the Abrahamic covenant. And we talked about that uh, already as God gave uh, promises about how he was going to uh, fulfill uh, and reverse all the F words, all the consequences that we brought into our lives. Now, the next covenant that he makes promises is around Moses and the Mosaic Covenant. And I just want to read a real brief picture uh, of, of the, the Mosaic Covenant from Exodus chapter 19. So, then Moses went up to God. Now remember, right at this point, uh, Israel has already been delivered. God has delivered Israel from uh, Egypt and slavery that is there. Greg talked about that, how the 10 plagues came, Pharaoh kept saying no, a plague would come, no, 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 till finally the 10th plague. God brings the angel of death and every firstborn son and every firstborn animal would die when the angel of death went through the land at that, uh, that night. But those that sacrificed the lamb and put the blood on their lentils and doorposts of their home, the angel of death passed over them. The next morning they woke up, there was death had ruled the land and the people that were under the blood were safe and Moses or Pharaoh let Moses take them and he let them go and they were delivered and rescued from slavery. This is after that. The, the story of God's rescue and how he rescued them through the blood of a lamb, then the Mosaic covenant happens and God goes, Moses goes up to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain and he says to him, this is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. All those people that you led out of Egypt, I want them to know this. You yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. So God was doing it to restore them to himself. Now, if you obey me fully, interesting, I've delivered you, and now my expectation is for you to obey me fully and keep my covenant, the covenant that I'm going to make with you through Moses. Then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession, and all the whole earth is mine. You will be for me a kingdom of priests. You alone of the whole world will be priests and a holy nation. These are the words you speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and he summoned the elders of the people and he set before them everything that God had commanded him to speak. And the people all responded together, we will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. You know, what's important to keep track of in this story is that the deliverance has already happened. Uh, God has already supernaturally rescued them from the slavery in Egypt and he's brought them out. And this passage actually occurs quite a bit after that deliverance. So they have already been rescued. But God now is going to make a covenant with them. He said, I, I've brought you to myself, but if you're going to follow me, then I want you to know you need to obey me and here's the things you need to obey in. And so he makes a covenant with them called the Mosaic Covenant. It's a covenant about how do we follow God once we belong to God. Because obedience is the sign of a person that truly follows God. Gerald and Elaine Charlton had a huge impact on me. Um, their son was my best man at my wedding. And uh, they, I worked for Gerald. I lived on the same campground as them, uh, Christian campground. They had a huge impact on me. And uh, at one time, after they had moved away from the camp and I would moved on, uh, I was back talking to them, visiting, and they had become foster parents in their late 40s, early 50s. And I thought, wow, what a time to become foster parents. And they got so good at it that CAS made them or considered them a premier home to put children into while they're being fostered until they could be placed. And I asked Gerald and Elaine, I said, why is it that they, you know, you, kids do so well in your home? And they said, you know, when they come in, we treat them with respect and dignity. We let them, we tell them that this is your home. Anything in it is yours to use anytime you want. And they said, but we make a few key rules that we say you need to obey these rules. And if you don't, there'll be consequences. And that's all we say. Invariably, the children will test them on those few key rules. And uh, Elaine said, you know, we don't yell, we don't scream, we don't go nuts. We just give them the consequences that we told them would come if they break the rules. And she said, you know, for most of the kids that come here, 
that gives them a sense of safety and boundaries. And they realize that when they obey, that their life is blessed, that their life is better than when they are always pushing against the boundaries. You know, that's exactly what the Mosaic Covenant is about, and that's exactly what uh, obedience to following Jesus is really about, is that God says, if you're going to follow me, if you're going to be my holy nation, my priesthood, if you're going to be my people, then you need to act like I would act in the situations you're in. And so here's my expectations, here's my commands of how you need to act. Now, when we put faith in Jesus, it's not just a mere assent to truth. By that, I don't mean, oh yeah, I believe Jesus died on the cross and that he saved my sins and, you know, I believe that mentally. Faith is more than just believing a set of facts. Faith is saying, I believe what I'm being told, the evidence for it is good, and I'm going to surrender my whole life to it. I'm going to place my life into it. See, faith isn't believing that my mechanic can, you know, take my tire off, fix it, and put it back on, and the car is safe to drive. Faith is believing that, but then getting in my car and driving it, trusting that the work that he's done is going to last. And faith isn't believing that, oh, I have a good doctor, you know, she's really good, she studies up all the time, and, you know, whatever she says is good, that's not faith. Faith is believing all that, but then taking the medication or take, having the operation she says I need to have. Well, faith in Jesus is not just believing in, a, you know, he died on the cross for our sins and that's it. It's that, but it's more. It's also saying, and I'm going to surrender my life to him. I'm going to obey him. And God says, when obedience always precedes blessing. And I think for some of us and for some of you, you're stuck in your Christian life because you're not obeying. God has made it clear that following Jesus means obeying Jesus. But you're challenging God on that, and you're not submitting to God on that. You see, obedience always quenches the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and always creates distance between us and God. And whether it's in the areas I talk about, whether it's the area of sex or money or your time or what you're watching on TV or how you're treating your spouse or how you're treating your employees or how you're treating your boss, how you're treating um, people in authority over you, how you respond to people that hurt you. You know, when we don't obey God and follow Jesus, and then it creates distance between us and God. And for some of you, the gap that you're feeling between you and God can only be fixed and remedied by your willingness to obey what he is telling you to do. So what is it that God may be calling you to obey, to, to, to stop doing what is wrong and start doing what is right? See, when you do, you'll find a renewed walk with God. All the people agreed to do the covenant and do what God had called them to do, to obey God. And the only problem was that they didn't. In fact, a few hundred years later, God speaks to the prophet Jeremiah and he says this in Jeremiah 11, verse 6. The Lord said to me, Proclaim all these words in the towns of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. Judah was a province of Israel. Jerusalem was the capital city. It's all where the people of Israel were living. From the time I brought your ancestors up from Egypt, which was what we just read about with Moses, until today, I warned them again and again, over and over, obey me. But they did not listen and they did not pay attention. But instead, they followed the stubbornness of their evil hearts. And so I brought on them all the curses of the covenant I had commanded them to follow, but they did not keep. You see, what this points out is that God gave them a covenant and said, if you're going to follow me, then you're going to obey me. And here are the things you need to do. And they all agreed, we'll do it, but they couldn't keep it. And it shows the condition of our heart, how our disobedience to God and our separation from him injures and affects our heart deeply. In fact, God says the stubbornness of their evil hearts. So we're broken from God. And the Mosaic Covenant shows that we, in ourselves and in of our own power and our own strength, can't follow God. Now, that raises a question, or a couple of them. The first is, well, why would God give the people of Israel a covenant that they would be incapable of following. Well, uh, when I 
coached hockey. I trained, I uh, went to trainers and sessions and seminars to learn how to be a coach in the minor hockey system. And one of the things one of the better trainers said is you've got to sometimes show kids what they can't do before they'll be willing to understand and do what they should do. What he meant that by that is, for instance, uh, when kids get the puck and they go in on the net, they, they don't want to pass it, they want to get the goal. And so they'll try to score even though they can't get a clear shot on that. So they would put a coach who would play defense one-on-one uh, -on -one with a kid coming and would always stop the kid until the kid got so frustrated and would say, well, I just can't get by him. And the coach would look at him and say, what else could you do? I don't know. I guess, I guess if I had somebody else, I could pass the puck. Sometimes we need to learn from what we experience because we won't learn from being told. If you're a parent, you know that's true with your kids. That sometimes we need to experience something, something that doesn't work, in order to learn what will work. So if this covenant that God made with them only showed them that their heart was broken and they of themselves aren't able to fulfill the law of God, well then what are people going to do? Like how's God going to rescue us if our hearts are so broken we can't live the kind of life that honor, honors God by our own strength? Well later on in the book of Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah uh, says, the days are coming, declares the Lord. He speaks the word of the Lord to the people. When I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel. God says the old one didn't work because of your brokenness of heart. He said, even, even though I was a husband to them, even though I was faithful in everything I said I would do, but they weren't faithful to me, I'm going to make a new covenant. Well, new in what way? Well, this covenant that I will make, I'm going to put my laws in their minds and I'm going to write my laws on their hearts. In other words, I'm going to change them from the inside out. I'm going to create within them a heart, a desire, a passion to follow me and to obey me. And I'm going to insert in their soul the truth of my word and the covenant. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 10, we're told that he's going to put his spirit within us. God himself is going to make a covenant with us, a new one, but this time he's going to actually enter into us to enable us to live the kind of life that honors him, a holy life, a righteous life, a life that is different. Now, there's two things we have to recognize and keep and understand when it comes to this new covenant. The first thing is that typically most people, there's this, believe this persistent lie that exists in our world. And that is if you said to them, well, what would happen to you if you died and you met God and then you got to give account of your life? And God said, well, why should I allow you to dwell with me? Why should I allow you into heaven, paradise? Most people will say, well, if there is a God, because the reality is some people aren't even sure there is a God, but if there were a God, I would say to him, well, I, I, I did my best. I tried hardest. I was kind to people. I gave to people. I never murdered anybody. And, and that is their uh, defense of what they would say to God when he would meet with them. But you think about it, that really doesn't answer the question. Because that's like a person who was caught drunk driving, standing before a judge, and the judge says, now um, I'm going to hold you accountable for your action. And the person says, well, I'm a nice person. I do the best. I coach hockey for the kids. I, I give to people. I'm kind to my neighbors. I didn't murder anybody. And the judge would respond, well, what's that got to do with drunk driving? You violated the law here, and now there's consequences for that. Even though you are a nice person, there's consequences. Even though you're a bad person, there's still consequences. And see, so that's the first thing we have to understand that when it comes to the covenant of God that he wants to make with us, we aren't able in and of ourselves to live the life God wants us to live. We aren't able to please God, to earn salvation. We're not able to do anything that's going to make us right with God. We must pay the consequences. But that's why Jesus took our place, died on the, Christ, uh, on the cross, paid the penalty for our sin, so that we could stand before God. And when he asked that question, we can say, I have no excuse. I am broken. I am a sinner. But Jesus has paid for everything and said, if I followed him, put my faith in him, followed him, that I would have all my sins dealt with. And there'd be nothing left to deal with when I stood before you. 
See, that's what Jesus did on the cross for us. He paid for our sin. But it requires a step of faith. And remember, faith is putting our trust and then following Jesus. It's, it's A, admitting that we are indeed broken, that we have violated God's laws, that we've disobeyed God. B, that we believe Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for our sins, that his death actually fully pays for all the consequences of our sins. And that C, we choose to surrender our life to him. So maybe that's your step that you need to take to be made right with God, to recognize, yeah, I'm not going to make it on my own. I need Jesus. I need Jesus to save me from my sin. But you have to choose whether you're going to put your faith in Christ. Now, the second persistent lie that uh, we believe is that once we have received Jesus as our Savior, we put our faith in him, that we now are able to live a life pleasing to God. And so we try to live in our own strength, uh, obedience, and live out. And what happens is the life that God calls us to is so contrary to what our sinful nature wants is that we begin to think that what the sinful nature wants is actually okay with God. But God holds us accountable to live in obedience to his word and, and to his commands to us. But he also gives us the spirit to empower us. Remember, he said, I'm going to make a new covenant. And I'm going to put my spirit within them so that the spirit gives them the strength and the ability to live what I'm calling them to live. In Romans chapter 8, verse 11, Paul writes, And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, the spirit of God, is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of the spirit who lives in you. So if you have put your faith in Jesus, God puts his spirit within us, and then he gives us life to be able to live the new life that he requires us to live. Therefore, brothers, says Paul, and therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. But it's not according to the flesh to live according to it. It's not according to live according to the sinful desires and the brokenness that is in us. For if we live to the flesh, we're going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you'll live. And so there's this battle going on within us. And that God is giving us His Spirit so that we can choose either to live by the power of His Spirit or by the brokenness of our spirit, our sinful nature. Now, the receiving of the Spirit and being filled by the Spirit and living by the Spirit is not a a process transaction. In other words, there's no formula to it. Well, if you pray this many prayers, you read this much of the Bible, if you do these good works, then you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, but if you don't, you won't. It's, not, it's a relational transaction. In other words, it's like every relationship you have. When you spend time and you seek relationship with that person, then that person begins to influence you. And so it is with the Holy Spirit, but to a greater degree. So that as you seek God in his word, not just reading it to read it, but say, God, I want to meet with you. I want to know you. And then when we pray and we call on God and we seek him from our spirit to say, God, I need you right now. Or I don't know what to do with this situation. Or I'm inviting you to help me to know. I want to walk according to you. And then when we're in community with people and let them speak into our lives so God can speak to us through them. Then we are getting and we ask, God, fill me with your spirit. Then we are filled because relationally we're connected with God and then he speaks into our lives. And out of that connection, we're then filled and empowered to choose what he's calling us to choose. That's exactly what happened when it came to the TV show I was telling you about. I, I, something in my spirit, the Holy Spirit, was telling me, this isn't good for you. And I struggled with it because I wanted to watch it. But then I, I kept feeling that sense of heaviness. And every time I went to the, 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 this was over a period of days, I'd go in, spend time in the Word, and it just seemed like all the Word talked about was I needed to stop. And so finally, I'm like, I can't figure this out. So I, 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 I don't understand what's wrong with that show. So I'm just going to ask some friends that I'm in community with. And God spoke through them. Until finally I'm like, you know what, I just need to obey what God is calling me to do. And the minute I did, I felt a, very, a sense of freedom and release from the weight that was on me. That's how the Spirit works. It's a relational aspect or transaction. It's not a process transaction. You know, in the end, it's about relationship with God. 
That's what Paul was talking about. The filling of the Spirit comes when we're, Jesus said in John 15, abiding with him, in relationship with him. So I want to ask you to ask yourself three simple questions. First question is, when do I seek God in his word? When do you do that? When? What, what time of day? What days? When do you seek God in his word? You see, it's in his word that he speaks to us most clearly and most often. That's how you communicate with God, which means that's how you build a relationship with him. So first question, when do I seek God in his word? Second question is a lot like it. When do I call on God in prayer? Not only do we listen to him in his word and let him have promptings in our spirit, but when we call on God, we're talking to him as well as inviting him to speak into our hearts. So when do you call on God? And the final thing I'll say is who do you meet with? Who do you talk with that you have community with? In other words, who is it that you talk with that, that encourages you and God uses to speak to you because you're both seeking God? Who's in your life that encourages you to know God and to follow God? So, when am I praying? When am I in the Word? Who is in my life that encourages me to grow? You see, through there the ways in which God fills us with His Spirit as we seek Him. Father, today I'm so grateful for the way that you have created a covenant in which you enable us, you empower us, you save us, you deal with our sin, and then you empower us to live a life honoring to you. Of course, of course we're not perfect. Of course, you keep calling us to new heights, to new fights, to new areas to change. But as we follow you and we call on you and we seek you, our relationship builds and you fill us and we have new power and new strength to live the life you're calling us to live. My prayer would be that for your people that are listening right now, my prayer is that they would have a fresh infilling of your spirit, that they would be willing to seek you in your word, in prayer, be willing to be open to hear from other people in their lives. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.